Welcome to the inaugural edition of Roundtable Prime, hosted by Double Line CEO Jeffrey Gunlack. Six thought leaders in today's financial markets will discuss their take on the economy and their outlook for the financial markets. Roundtable Prime will divide the discussion into three segments. This secondary segment, first filmed January 6, 2020, will cover financial market outlooks. The Roundtable guests, with decades in the financial markets, are recognized leaders in macroeconomic analysis, market research, and investment management. They bring together a broad array in different sectors of the financial markets, including government fixed income, credit, equities, real estate, and commodities. All have been sought after for their insights as speakers and as commentators in the financial media. And now, Double Line is pleased to introduce the honored guests of Roundtable Prime, our moderator and our host. Jeffrey Sherman will moderate today's discussions. Jeffrey Sherman is Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line Capital and a portfolio manager of a number of Double Line's fixed income and derivatives-based strategies. He also hosts the Sherman Show podcast series, which has featured many of today's distinguished guests. Ed Hyman is chairman of Evercore ISI, where he heads the economic research team. For the past 44 years, Ed has been ranked by Institutional Investor Poll of Investors for Economics and ranked number one for 39 years. Ed Hyman is highly regarded for his origination of econometric modeling and real-time surveys to gain insight into the unfolding business and market cycles. James Bianco is president and macro strategist at Bianco Research, which he established with the aim of originating insights unencumbered by traditional Wall Street research. His commentaries address such diverse subjects as monetary policy, the intersection of markets and politics, fund flows, and asset allocation. Jeffrey Gundlach, host of Roundtable Prime, is founder and CEO of Double Line Capital, an investment manager with investment strategies in fixed income, equity, real estate, and commodities. In 2012, 2015, and 2016, he was named to Bloomberg Magazine's 50 Most Influential. In 2017, he was inducted into the FIASI Fixed Income Hall of Fame. Stephen Romick is a managing partner and portfolio manager at Los Angeles-based First Pacific Advisors. He is the founding portfolio manager of the FPA Crescent Fund, as well as other funds. Since 1993, FPA Crescent's goal has been to generate equity-like returns over the long term, take less risk than the market, and avoid permanent impairment of capital. Among other awards and nominations, he and his co-portfolio managers were named Morningstar's U.S. Allocation Fund Manager of the Year in 2013. Danielle DiMartino Booth is CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence, a research and analytics firm whose commentary appears in the Daily Feather and the Weekly Quill. Prior to Quill, she served throughout the credit crisis as advisor to Richard Fisher, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She is author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Fed is bad for America. David Rosenberg is Chief Economist and Strategist of Rosenberg Research and Associates, an economic consulting firm providing analysis and insights to help investors make well-informed decisions. Prior to founding the firm, he was Chief Economist and Strategist at Gluskin Chef and Associates. From 2002 to 2009, he held those positions at Merrill Lynch in New York, where he was consistently ranked in the Institutional Investor All-Star Analysis Rankings. Jeffrey Sherman, Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line, will now open the second of three segments of Roundtable Prime. So picking up where we left off, uh, we were just talking about um, the pressure, uh, disinflationary pressures. Jim, you referred to as the Amazon effect. Ed, I thought you brought up a good point about globalization. And we think about globalization as cooperation. Cooperation tends to lead itself to bull markets, right, where people are agreeing. Um, something I learned from you, Jeffrey, divisiveness is, is the uh, key ingredient to having a bear market, right? Um, thinking about this and, and the trends we've seen over the last three to four years, we've seen Brexit, uh, the rise of populism, uh, the rise of someone like President Trump. Um, what does that hold for us, uh, thinking about globalization or the, the fact maybe we go to more a nationalistic approach? Steve, let's start with you. As an equity investor, you know how do you build that into the psychosis of, 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 of the, or how do you build the psychosis of the market into your thinking, and how does that play out, let's say, over the next decade? As we look around the world, I mean, it's it's, it's the world likes the U.S., likes the U.S. dollar, likes U.S. equities, 
And as we where we sit, it's just become it's become the repository. Everybody's showing up there, and that na nationalistic. We have great fear right now as we look around the world and look at the nationalistic, you know, you know, fervor that exists, whether it be in the UK, and you know, to the extent that it's happened in the US, it's happened in Chile, where where riots started as a result of you know increase in bus and subway fares, and it makes it it makes it a lot harder. I mean, it raises the question as to what's the right discount rate you know, that one should apply, discount one should apply to looking at assets in these different countries. So we, we're, from where we sit, we actually have expanded our, our, our global reach in, recent, in the recent year and a half as we've sold more of the U.S. down and invested more overseas. Our equity portfolios have actually increased by you know, for about 20% of the portfolio was outside the U.S. Now it's it's a little bit more than 30%. Now even that's a little bit misleading because I mean half the sales of the companies in the United States are from outside the U.S. So we're very very mindful of that. We're, so we look at a lot of this and we do debt and equity investing both distressed debt. Uh, high yield bonds in the portfolio. We're not looking at investment grade. We're not looking at conservative mortgages in our, in our portfolios. But with this kind of jingoistic fervor that exists, we it's a lot. You know, we really want to stay close to home on the debt side. That's for darn sure. We just don't want to be the one going through a restructuring. And you know, in in Chile, you know, Argentina, you know, with some you know some American going down over there and 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 getting our, our heads handed to us. So we are much more cautious about investing outside the U.S. We really want to make sure that we focus on the higher, higher quality businesses on the equity side that have more global franchises. Mm -hmm. So with that, Dave, what did you pick that one up to? I, as I'm thinking about nationalist approach, if you, if you don't have free trade, you don't have the ease of moving goods back and forth, the ease of moving labor back and forth, wouldn't that, couldn't that be the catalyst or a catalyst for having higher levels of inflation? Well, look, it depends on how you want to define or measure inflation. Uh, there's no doubt that if the world turns inward, uh, and I think it is, and, and by the way, I don't even refer to it as, as, as populism, okay? I, that's the, the popular term. It's really economic nationalism. Okay. And uh, this whole, by the way, uh, mentality or the way we view the world, because we haven't been alive that long in overall context of the history of the world, this whole concept of globalization, the whole post- Marshall Plan, Bretton Woods, uh, that we had on our hands uh, the way we knew it is something brand spanking new. What we've had in the past 70 years uh, in the context of global history was brand spanking new. We're actually probably reverting <laughs> to pre-World War II institutions. That's something that we should probably consider. Yes, at the margin, that will lead to a higher cost structure. Um, the question then becomes, does that lead to final inflation? And that's what I was saying before. That will come down to the degree of excess capacity that's already existing in the economy. But the problem right now is that we are stuck in a global economy right now, especially in the product market of excess capacity. Uh, and you can see that in the global industrial operating rate. So even if we go into that situation of reversal of globalization, it's going to take a long, long time for companies to be able to raise their prices. And that's what inflation is. Inflation is not at the cost side. It's at the final stage side. You have to be able to raise those prices to consumers and make them stick. And that will not happen for the next couple of years. Now, I'm not going to say at some point it's not going to happen down in the future, especially if we're going to talk about globalization reversal. Okay, if we're talking about this in the context where we're already at a situation where the output gap, as I said before, was say positive, not negative, well then we can talk about that fostering some sort of inflationary environment. It's what happens, can you make the price increases stick at the final stage of production? And that's gonna take a long time, irrespective of what happens in terms of global cross-border trade flows in the next several years. Yeah. Well, we talked about expectations, that's what you brought up, Ed. You know, University of Michigan surveys, the Fed uses all kinds of measures of, of inflation expectations. So Danielle, how does the Fed view that in that lens? Well, look, I think that, that you need to realize that um, th th there's a funny story that when, when Stanley Fisher became vice chairman of, of the Fed, that he, uh, he asked the question, why do you insist on using PCE or core PCE? And uh, an, an intrepid Fed staffer raised their hand and said, because if we didn't, all the models would break. <laughs> so it's not that... Um, and, and, uh, um, to which uh, a Fed president said, let me get this straight, we make monetary policy garbage in, garbage out. Um, 
But you have to understand it's that comforting. even... comforting. <laughs> oh, yeah, very comforting. Yeah. Uh, but you have to understand that the Fed is forced to look at inflation through that singular prism because if they didn't, they would have been tightening all along the way because we've had core CPI north of 2% for, what, 20 months or so. So uh, you have to understand that it is the core PCE that is driving Fed policy because of its construct. They use Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement rates to, um, I don't pay Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates for my health care premiums. They're going up at a much appreciably faster rate. Housing is increasing at a faster rate than what you're going to see reflected in these numbers. But I think Fed officials in their bones know that they're never going to hit this target. So it, it really, it's, it, it's an irrelevant point, if you will. Because the Fed knows that even if other, if, if the universal in inflation um, that, that comes out of the New York Fed, for example, or, or the trim mean out of Dallas, they've been north of 2% as well. The Fed has become supremely gifted at ignoring everything but the one that they take cover behind. Yeah, and so, I think that you have to realize that. So with that, but, let's but take... But isn't it sort of transparently obvious that using Medicare reimbursement rates understates health care costs? Well, of course it is. I mean, it just seems like it would be the easiest thing But to... you can't get anybody at the Fed to acknowledge it. But that's the main reason for the discrepancy between core CPI and core PCE right now. It, it's a lot of it comes from healthcare. The other part, as you mentioned, was housing. Right. And so of you course. saw that, and you've seen that this be the reason there's been spikes in core CPIs of late. Because I, I think the year-over-year -year healthcare rate was like five percent on the last print. I right. Tell you right through the CPI measure, but not through the PCE measure. And that is where it is relevant. But again, you cannot get a single Fed official to acknowledge it. Yeah. So on that, Jeffrey, how is the market price in inflation? You look at break-evens and thinking about. Uh, future, because as a bond investor, inflation is one of the biggest uh, detriments uh, or can be on a go forward basis. So how's the market thinking about that? Are they lulled into the expectation side? Is it the backward looking prism the Fed's using or is just the market? I think they've just been bludgeoned into submission because the inflation rate has been so constant for so long that uh, predictions of a delta have just been mis misplaced for so long that people sort of give up. And so we've seen periods where the break-even on inflation was the same for three months, one year, three years, five years, 10 years, 30 years, all basically at 1.9. And so the market is exactly in sync with that. So uh, one thing that's happened, unfortunately, is if you believe the core CPI, and even if you believe only the core PCE, we have a bond market that's priced at zero or negative real yields, which I think is really the goal here. I think the goal of the central bankers is, to, I think they understand that debt compounding at this debt level is problematic. One of the ways that you forestall the day of reckoning is you have the interest rate lower than the inflation rate, so that you are slowly at this point, and maybe you can accelerate that, you're basically debasing the value of, of those, uh, those, those debt uh, the, the, that comes due in the future. And that seems to be, that's kind of what, mon, you mentioned MMT, modern monetary theory, that's basically what it is. Let's run the interest rate lower than the inflation rate or the economic growth rate. And in that way, we can, the, the theory is that we can then sustain infinite amounts of debt. Of course, the problem with modern monetary theory is that it's a total sleight of hand. You're comparing past past uh, economic growth to future interest payments. So just the fact that past economic growth was below the interest rate doesn't mean that it won't be, that that'll s sustain. You can easily have economic growth go negative at some point in time, then all of a sudden the debt rate's way above the economic growth rate. But right now the, the bond market is, ex is being manipulated, of course, by, uh, at, the, at the short end by some of the quantitative easing. But investors have become willing, thanks to the lack of yield in Japan, the lack of yield in Europe, they've become uh, accepting of interest rates that are less than the inflation rate, which is a very, very problematic situation for those that are trying to maintain purchasing power through bond investment. Yeah. Perverts, well, perverts capital allocation decisions, I mean, across, across the board and around the world. I mean, every, every cash flow that you want to go and value is going to be worth more, you know, at the end of the day. And that creates you know, great problems because it bids these assets up. And, and so you've got this Wall Street inflation and other types of assets. And yet the real person you know, on the street who doesn't have that same kind of portfolio is not a beneficiary. I mean, in 2007, when the 10-year was at 5%, somebody, if somebody was fortunate enough to have 
a two and a half million dollars, say they got $125,000 in income. Today, adjusted for inflation, that's what, $35,000, $38,000. So you've had a real decline in their purchase. So what do they have? They have three choices. They can either reduce their lifestyle, they can spend their principal, harder to do with smaller amounts of money, or they can take on more risk. Most people have chosen door number three. Mm -hmm. So, so with that, and if you take the extension of the low rates in the treasury market, it's led to obviously a pricing spread on corporate debt being very low by historical standards. For not the spread part, but all the all-in yield, as I'll call it, right? The yield on corporate debt. And so there's been a lot of criticisms. Steve, I'll address this to you real quick. Um, that a lot of the debt spending has led to corporate buybacks, which has really um, justified some of the, the multiples that you've seen in the marketplace today. As a value investor, one, how do you think about that? And secondly, ultimately, what does this lead to in terms of the outlook for PE multiples? I have yelled at companies over the years, written letters to boards and you know, in, in, in management about buying shares back at points in time once they track them. They won't do it because they're scared in 08 and 09. And now I tell them, please, you know, you know, beg off of that a bit because mm -hmm. <laughs> look at where your prices are. And, and they just keep on doing it because they have some activist there who says it's a good idea. And Sherry purchases, I don't know exactly the number to what, to what extent it's actually driven you know, the stock market. I do know that we've taken supply off the market, taken supply both through as a result of sherry purchases, as well as corporate acquisitions, whether it be LBOs or acquisitions of you know, one public company of another, of another public company. So now the Wall Street 5000 index is less than 4000. So we haven't, you know, I think we peaked at 7500 or so back in 1998. So it's clearly less, you know, less supply, you know, out there, out there today. I think that you see a lot of these companies with these sherry purchases that have made their earnings look better. I mean, Procter & Gamble, which is secularly challenged you know, to a degree, harmed, in fact, by uh, the ability to break brands on the Internet. If you look at their earnings growth over the last seven or eight years, their EPS growth is actually 1%. But that's because of sherry purchase. If you back out the sherry purchase, it's actually slightly negative. Mm -hmm. And this is a company that... You know, as I argued, you know, as I argue, is challenged and yet trades at 20 something some odd times earnings. So why? Because it's got a nice dividend yield and people are attracted and, and feel that need to to get something that that gives them that kind of, of, of spending power that's higher than because their dividend yield is higher than than the treasury rate than what they're getting there. Oh, and they get you know, appreciation has been one of the best, was one of the better performing stocks in the S&P last year. So everything's perverted. And we sit there, you know, look at each other across our desk and we just, you know, we're confounded by it because it's as if, you know, this, this, these steps that are being taken are going to all end well. And I don't know where and how and when, you know, it all ends, but it scares the hell out of us, which is why we, you know, we today have a more cautiously you know, positioned portfolio. And for somebody who invests in high yield, you know, is a big, big part of my, my, my past, we've got almost nothing to do. We have one name in there today, high yield distress, but we, we're doing almost nothing. For somebody who had 30 some odd percent in high yield distress, you know, back in, in 2000, you know, early in 2009, you know, we're, we're sitting there with less than, less than, you know, 4%. And the bulk of that was in Puerto Rico, which we bought a few years back. Yeah. Well, you'd mentioned too, um, when, uh, the amount of like the float outstanding, right? There's less shares, there's less companies out there. Um, let's talk about the proliferation of, of indexing, right? It's caught on, uh, it's cheap to do, zero cost, zero commission now. Um, what is the impact of that in the allocation of capital across a, a, an equity market? What does that do? Does it distort things? Is it just giving people the terms, better Well, ask? indexation in equities is definitionally momentum investing. Mm -hmm. You're buying more and more and more of the stocks that are working? doing better and better and better. And that's great when you have the fangs that are leading, leading the train and, and they are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and, but, but obviously that has an unwind situation as well. But when it comes to I indexing, it's remarkable how the pendulum swings. In the mid-1990s, there was tremendous uh, demand for bond indexation. The, 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 the whole term core bond investing was a euphemism for indexing. It was basically incredibly tight guidelines, and that, therefore you were going to get something very close to an index return. And the reason it was popular was because it worked. I mean, if you were sitting on a pension committee, you would go in there and say, oh, God, now we've got to talk about this bond part of our portfolio, which is, is dry as dust. And they go like, okay, well, the one-year return is 8%, the three-year return is 8%, the five-year return is 8%, our extra return is 8%. Any questions? <laughs> Good, let's go talk about some private equity or something interesting. 
<laughs> That's what, the, I was an active manager at the time and it was brutally difficult to get people to care. Now, people want indexation in stocks. Back in the 1990s, they wanted active management in stocks. And now it's exactly the opposite, that there's a great fondness for uh, equity indexation, particularly just the, 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 the spies, right? And yet, nobody really wants bond indexation. Or why should they? I mean, you look at the bond index and you're saying, hey, I've got a yield of 2.5%. I've got an uh, interest rate risk that's about, you know, th three times that or two, two and a half times that. I mean, how is this gonna work for me? My actual rate is now 7.25, seven and a quarter percent, and this is a guaranteed hole in what I'm doing. And so what's become popular on the bond side more, more recently, it's a little less than it was three years ago, is active management on steroids, unconstrained bonds, no guidelines whatsoever, negative duration, very, very long duration, shorting, just don't even tell me what you're doing because if you tell me, I probably won't like what I'm seeing. So unconstrained is active management on steroids. At the same time, is there's this overwhelming movement in equities towards indexation because just like in the 90s, the bonds worked, it's working. Right. I mean, how do you outperform a, a stock index as an active manager when you have 3% cash and the market goes up 30%? And that's well, there, goes, that's, there goes 100 basis points right there. And that's 90% of flows into stocks. 90% right now, passive. Yeah. Well, I, I look at, 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 passive, at passive in general and look at equities and fixed income, and I think there's this, there's this liquidity illusion that's going to come back and bite us in the ass. Can I say ass in this panel? Sure, you just did. Right. You just okay. did. I said it twice. I said it twice, actually. <laughs> um, and it's, 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 it's going to hurt us because this liquidity, you, you can't have something that ostensibly is liquid on the surface and yet invest in the illiquid. So sure. those ETFs, you know, and other, you know, index funds, you know, they're investing in, particularly that in the, in the illiquid, I'll specifically <laughs> reference small cap stocks. I mean, there are small cap stocks that we've come across where there's 40, 50% held by, you know, by passive funds. And we see what happens when, you know, basically we watch them on flow days, and we see what's happening to these stocks. We see them move up, and we see them move down. And it created a lot of opportunity for us, or some, not a lot, but some opportunity for us back in, the, uh, in December of, of 2018 uh, when we began to really allocate you know, some capital to these. It's also true of bonds because you can't have these. I think one of the reasons why we, picked, we were able to pick up this one company that I, that I can't discuss on the debt side was because it le came out of the levered loan side. And, and there was just, they, they just, I don't know if it was owned by a CLO or it was owned by an ETF. There was just, a, it, it just hit a, an air gap in pricing. We were, we, were, we were already there, and we understood it in this business, so we were able to pick it up. But there is a massive amount of illiquidity that shows up in the high yield market. And I've lived this back in, in, the, in, in the late 89, 90, you know, time frame, when Drexel was, was having, a, you know, a tough time. And then we, had, we, had, we went from there into a recession. I lived through this, you know, back when WorldCom, you know, was, and, and others, and Enron were, were blowing up. I lived this in 08, 08 09, and I'm going to live through this again. I don't know when, but it's going to be magnified, you know, by passive funds. And we will get these BWICs. Well, we won't get them by fax machine anymore. We'll get them via email. And where people are looking for bids wanted. And we're just going to, you know, be there hopefully with uh, whatever capital, you know, we have left. Because, you know, for those people who haven't fired as yet, is they want to go passive. Right. <laughs> but it is a bit of an alchemy that what we're seeing in the, in the markets. Let's take um, high yield. Um, if you... Um, if you believe the numbers, uh, there's about nine billion paramount that trades in high yield every day. Um, and if you look at the uh, market value of HYG, which is BlackRock's high yield fund, JNK, which is Barclays high yield fund, that's nearly 40% right there. Is 40% of the market is trading off of, uh, off of the ETF itself. BlackRock, BlackRock Club, likes to talk about the, the shadow NAV. In other words, what they like to tell people is that there's really never a tracking error with our fund because whatever price it goes to, the market will eventually follow it there. So it's just leading the market uh, along and it gives the illusion of liquidity. There are hedge funds now that day trade high yield. How, how do you day trade high yield? Well, they day trade HYG and they think that they're day trading high yield. So that market is being, and they're going the next step too. Let's take another set of um, illiquid markets, frontier markets. 
it's too hard to buy Nigeria or Gabon. Where the hell is Gabon? Don't worry, just go ahead and play the uh, HR, not the HYG, but the BlackRock Frontier Market ETF. There you go. Now you've got yourself some exposure and it's, it's tradable and you can play along with that game. And then they go to the next step. And the, and the next step is that you are allowed to do um, uh, payment in kind. Payment in kind is standard language in the ETF perspectives that says, if I own some of, this, if I own some of the uh, ETF, I can exchange it for the underlying assets. And they actually promote that. Don't call up Goldman Sachs and get frustrated trying to buy Gabon or high yield. Buy $100 million of our ETF and call us up and we'll do an exchange. Now, it'll have to be representative of the index. You don't get to pick and choose the bonds you want, but somewhat representative of the index. You could give us some rules, and as long as we agree upon it, we can do an exchange. So we're uh, giving this liquidity illusion with ETFs that, was, that did not exist. Because if you go back and look at the data in 2009-10, where it's 40% of the high yield market, it was less than two back then, this, this kind of trading. So this is new to this cycle. Yeah, you talk about alchemy. It's it's always a big red flag when you start to see the alchemy happening. You remember back in 2006, we were turning triple Bs into triple As <laughs> yeah. uh, by repackaging. So we were taking something that was fundamentally a, a marginal credit from an investment grade perspective and turning it into a large fraction of pristine credit. Well, that it doesn't work. It's, you can't, you know, no one's been able to turn lead into gold and no one can turn a triple uh, B into a triple A. But now, as Jim is pointing out, what we've got are we're taking, and, and, and Steve, we're taking illiquid products and we are giving them the clothing of liquidity. I th you, you mentioned uh, the high yield and you mentioned small cap stocks. I would, I would absolutely throw bank loans into that equation sure. much more because when the market shuts down like it did in the fourth quarter of 18, bank loans, you're talking about T plus 50 to try to get a trade settled. And on a good day, it's probably T plus 14. So how can you have daily liquidity being advertised when the underlying assets have nothing resembling daily liquidity? These things and yet they've, can they've go built... on. They, I mean, I, I, th I thought the alchemy that was going on in the OOs, I was trying to get people to pay attention to it in early 05. And nobody wanted to listen about it. But, you know, it took, took two or three years for the, 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 for the cancer to, to get uh, metastasized badly enough. But I think, that and that was and back when you had, you know, you know, a market that was was, uh, you know, less than half the size, and you had a lot of bonds on trading desks at the time that could help. You know, or the, the system. Or this the is this is this is pre, pre Dodd Frank, and now yeah. we've got bond inventories at broker dealers Come down three you know, hundred billion down ninety percent. It's it's insane, and and so you're going to have it's going to be the the grace of. of private equity people to give you a decent bid-ass spread. Good luck with that. Well, that's the value. You don't have to look past the oil patch to know that there isn't enough capital there to do that. Mm -hmm. right? So there are all these, these these energy patch investors who who bailed it out last time and made a lot of investments in, in 15, 16. Now it's it's a, it's a to whom situation for a lot of these these assets down in in, uh, in Texas, Oklahoma. Well, now they're looking for, for cash flow, not pro forma anything. So let's keep in mind who's buying this stuff. Um, about the estimates are about two-thirds of all ETFs are held, not traded, but held in, a, in an account directed by a wealth manager. That today, the big elephant in the room that we hardly ever talk about is the public wants their hand held. They want to be given professional management. It used to be, to put the metaphor on it, it used to be some manager in a big office building in New York or Boston that was running a fund. Today, it's an Edward Jones manager. There are 13,000 wealth management firms in the United States employing 460,000 wealth managers, and they have 43 million accounts, which is 75% of the net worth of the United States, has, is being directed at some point at the wealth management community. The reason that that has gotten so big is we've created a very efficient tool for them, the ETF. Half those 13,000 firms are two people or less. How do I manage a fund? Uh, how do I manage an allocation without having some big bank? Well, I could do it with ETFs. I can buy you some stock ETFs, some bond ETFs, some international ETFs, some alternative ETFs, and I could move you around a lot. Why do we have this insane fee war in ETFs? You've seen the numbers. 
that Vanguard cuts their corporate bond ETF fee one basis point below the BlackRock, and $6 billion flows into it, and $6 billion out, out of the other one. How does that happen? Because the robo-advisors and all of the other advisors, their, their model portfolios, they instantly change. It's not that the dentists or the doctors are saying, oh, wow, I could trade out of this into a lower fee. It's the, it's the wealth manager, because if he can compress down the fees of the ETFs, that's more VIG for him. So that's been pushing us all the way to negative. So the wealth manager's been driving all of this. And behind all of that, why does a person go to a wealth manager? Because if you have some wealth, let's put some demographics on somebody who's got some wealth. You're 50 plus. You've seen 2000, you've seen 2008. And your biggest concern is not appreciation of money, it's I don't wanna have another 50% haircut. If you were really concerned, if you really thought about risk, I don't need a wealth manager, I can buy SPY or some version of that, I don't need to go. To, but you go to a wealth manager and what do they do? They put you in some version of the 60-40 portfolio. And that seems to have worked tremendously, and that seems, it has worked tremendously over the last couple of years, including 2019, had its best year in 22 years. And if you look at the flows, it's not surprising that over the last five years, 60% of the money that's gone into ETFs has gone into equities and 40 has gone into fixed income. So all of this money is being driven by the wealth manager. I think that a lot of people underappreciate the role that the wealth manager has in the flows and the asset allocation decisions in the United States right now. And as we talk today, it's worked tremendously for them. Now, if we get inflation and you get that falling of stock and bond prices together, that could be a real game changer for a lot of those 13,000 managers explaining those $43 million accounts, uh, or 43 million accounts, why you're losing money. But that's really what's driving this right now. It is the wealth manager. It's There's the also a lot of herding mentality that's camouflaged as being customization mm -hmm. with like robo advisors. You fill out, you fill out a spreadsheet and you get a you get a solution, as they call them these days, for your needs. Unfortunately, everybody's spreadsheet's identical. Every single person says, my uh, personality of investing is growth with safety. Every single person says that, growth with safety. And everyone says, well, when do we want to retire? And they put in the same, the same number and how much money, and they all get exactly the same solution. So once you get to an unwinding of the herding mentality, you exacerbate the magnitude of the movement. Right. I mean, otherwise, you're right. You get that hurting mentality because if my answer was different, I want risk. I want to make a lot of money. I don't need the Schwab robo-advisor. I can just go out and buy some double-levered ETFs on my own in five seconds and I'm done. But there's not a lot of people that do that. They want their hand held. And that's what I think has been lost in this passive-active debate. It's not that the public says, oh, I can do it on my own. It's that they've shifted to the wealth manager and the wealth manager is pushing them into these holistic 60-40s that seem to be working for the moment. Yeah. So with, with that backdrop, um, how does this change, right? Does it take a downturn in multiple uh, asset classes simultaneously? Is it the old saying about diversification is not there when you need it, it's only there when you don't really want it, when markets are going up. How does that change, Ed, how do you think about it? Yeah, so uh, you know, my basic, uh, feeling on all these things is uh, the view that you want to be a contrarian in investing. And so when everybody is cautious, uh, which I'm on a panel where basically everybody here is cautious, I'm sort of thinking maybe the other way is right. I happen to think you're all correct, but I think it will, it will happen when you get some inflation, which may take years, uh, and you get uh, a significant tightening by the Fed, inverted yield curve. So I mentioned earlier about the super bull markets, no inflation in 25, 26, 19, 27, 1928, 1929, uh, but the policy rate ended up at 7%. Then the bond yield went to six, you had a, a downturn, which turned out to be <laughs> a depression. A big one, yeah. Uh, but at that point, as as students, we know people had gotten really bullish. Irving Fisher, we've entered Permanent plateau of prosperity. Uh, and it seems to me that we're a long way from that. Uh, 
And I'm not sure how this will play, play out, but I think at some point uh, there'll be some people uh, that want to take their stuff being held and start to do better. I've had two conversations uh, with fund managers, uh, both of whom one is, has done enormously well and the other one has done very well. And this guy said, well, I used to work at this place and my colleagues would basically uh, sell uh, at the low and buy at the high. <laughs> That's easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's pretty easy to do. And he says, so I have gone out and have found a group of clients that give me a longer time frame. So he didn't panic out in 2018, and he's up like 45% in 2019. And I can see where uh, if you get people that are active managers uh, and whatever stocks they pick happen to go up, you could get a, a shift. Uh, but I'm not holding my breath for it. I'm I think you get a shift when you have uh, a, a weaker market. I mean, I think people just react to, to, uh, to, to, to negatives. You know, but when it comes to what, what, what changes this sort of paradigm of the ETFs and everything, I think it's really simple. You either, either have higher interest rates, which would just change everything. Right. Higher interest rates would, would just torpedo everything. Or else, and maybe they're simultaneous, which would be doubly painful, uh, an economic downturn. Uh, I, I actually believe, and I've said this repeatedly, that left to its own devices, and the repo market problem in September reinforces my thinking here, that in the next recession, you'd probably see higher long-term interest rates if you had to actually sell them to people rather than the Fed. Mm -hmm. But as we saw in 2018, it, it took three and a quarter on the 10-year to cause some real problems. And that's not a very high level when you're talking about a 2% inflation rate. And that threshold keeps coming down, by the way. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the breaking point seems to get lower all the time. Absolutely. You, you had that in, in late 2018. Um, I was terming it the, the primal scream, but it ended real fast. In, if you go back November, December 2018, stocks fell, fell a lot. Bonds didn't do a whole lot. Interest rates were kind of stable to slightly higher. And that wealth management community was, what's going on here? Because if stocks are going to go down 15%, shouldn't my bond 40 leg be going straight up to offset <laughs> it? And it wasn't happening. And they were getting very concerned. And then Paul pivoted on January 4th. So that, that concern went away real fast. So you've seen that that is what I think would really cause is if you got to an environment where stocks and bonds both went down together. Which would really be just yields rising, but almost guarantee a big mm -hmm. drop in the stock market. It would R completely right. end buybacks. You would, have, you would have all kinds of liquidity problems in, in the, the lower tier credit market. And you know, speaking of, um, you know, you're right. We went to three and a quarter in, in September of 18 and the, and the stock market crumbled. You know what happened the first two weeks of January? Uh, we, we bottomed at 144 on the 10-year note. 10 days later, we were trading 185. It was 40 basis point rise in 10 days. I remember we were tracking, it was like the biggest 10-day rise in yield since, since 2011. And then the next day was the repo crisis. It's like every time rates go up meaningfully, something breaks. And 40 right. is now meaningfully. Yeah, yeah. Now 40 basis points to 185 is all you need to start breaking things because that's really what pre – I'm not saying that that's what caused the repo crisis. I'm saying that that's what immediately preceded it was a big rise in rates, and then it snapped. And it's been snapped ever since. So the market can't handle any kind of real rise in rates. So if you got that, and it also broke stocks – that f those 43 million accounts uh, with those 13,000 wealth managers are going to have a, that primal scream I saw beginning in the fourth quarter will be much, much louder. And everything that's just been described at this table explains why Jay Powell's in a corner. Mm -hmm. So last year, if you look at earnings and uh, for S&P 500 companies, they're essentially flattish for the year. Um, you had a big multiple expansion. Well, that's, that's a little disingenuous just given where the low in rates or low in markets were at the end of 2018. Um, wh what do earnings look like this year? Is it still the standard? Oh, it's 10 percent. Then it's going to be 8 percent. Jim, you've, you've been following this for many years of just that consistent lowering of it. And if so, where does the growth come from? I mean, we've squeezed the juice out of having low rates. Uh, we've cut costs, you know, at, at the bottom uh, to improve the bottom line. Where does earnings growth come from at this stage in the cycle? 
So I, I, one of our big calls for this year is that because companies have seen their currency appreciate as much as they have, i.e. their equity price, that we could see quite the M&A boom uh, headed into the beginning of this year. And that would extract further, that, that would bring about further cost cuts at companies, which means layoffs. Um, but, but right now, you've got 58% of CFOs in a cost-cutting mode, and, and, and top-line growth has been ticking down. So I think that they're going to look at this equity price that they have, look at this, at this overvalued currency, and say, I'm going to go buy the growth that I need because I can't get it out of my organic fundamental operations. So, short answer. Yeah. yeah or or are you else? just going to yeah. get an economic rebound? That's kind of what everybody's betting on is an economic rebound. One of the things that's interesting about the stock market, Ned Davis has done a lot of work on this, is in so-so earnings years, 2019, zero earnings growth, you get great returns because the stock market's doing what it's supposed to do, anticipating what's coming next. Just like if you backed up 2017 was a great big up year in the stock market. Um, and then 2018, we got, and there was tax inspired in there, but over 25% year over year earnings growth. 2018, the market went sideways. 2019, we had no earnings. So their bet is that by mid-year, you're going to see much stronger growth, both domestically and internationally, that's going to produce those earnings. I like to say, you know, use a football metaphor, it's, it's the 50-yard pass, right? If you've ever watched a quarterback throw a 50-yard pass and you're not watching closely, you go, he just threw it in the middle of the field down there where nobody is, and you're, and you're hoping the speedy receiver runs under it and catches it. Well, that speedy receiver is fundamentals. Where the market has just thrown a 50-yard pass, and it's now hoping that the fundamentals will catch up to it by the middle of the year. If they do, it's fine. If they don't, then it's going to be an incomplete pass, and then it'll have to uh, correct. And most 50-yard passes tend to be incomplete. So we'll see where I, it goes. I don't, I don't I don't, I don't know how to think about this metaphor, but uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, you get uh, economic slowdown, mm -hmm. central banks ease, the pivot, whatever you want to call it, money growth at 7%. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that year, uh, earnings don't do very much, but in the next year, the economy pick, picks up. It's not a miracle pass. Right. It's a sequence of events. Right. Uh, and, and now, in my opinion, uh, you know, we're seeing the markets respond. Uh, and my bet is that the economy is better in, I don't know about the past, <laughs> in 2020, and that earnings will be up. You know, I don't know, I'm not bullish on earnings, but they'll, 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 they'll be up, okay. is my view of things. So contain our view of today. Let's go to the other book. And Dave, you look like you're I feel like uh, it was a horse shack and welcome back, Carter. I've been like... <laughs> 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 I mean, well, for, look, I mean, like, Tom everybody's entitled boots. to their forecast. But <laughs> the first thing is, is that what has been the primary driving force for the equity market undeniably has been share buybacks. OK, so you have earnings per share and then you have dollar trillion, the two trillion dollar of earnings, small cap, large cap, mid cap, mon pa companies that don't trade publicly. That's called national account earnings. OK have not grown for five years. And we've known what the equity space has done in terms of valuing equities, okay? So the dollar value of earnings, we know what they've done. They've done nothing for a half decade in the context of one of the most powerful bull markets ever. So if I was gonna put myself in Danielle's shoes, I would just say, look, if the equity market's going up or earnings per share going up next year, it's gonna be because we're gonna continue to get share buybacks. That's really, the, the, the classic financial engineering that's defined the cycle. We had four trillion of QE. Translate miraculously is the Fed created this vacuum in the debt markets for companies to issue four trillion dollars of debt. You see the symmetry to finance four trillion dollars of share buybacks. This goes down as the weakest capital spending cycle of all time. But you see, when I went to school and we learned about what companies do in terms of raising capital, say in the debt markets, it usually went into capital expenditure, <laughs> but not this time. It went into the stock market. And yet one of the strongest stock markets coincided with one of the weakest expansions of all time, whether you're taking a look at aggregate supply or aggregate demand. Okay, so that's really the anomaly here is that this is the first cycle ever where the correlation between the S&P 500 and GDP is 7%, seven. Historically, in any other cycle, it's as low as 30, 
and as high as 70, because of course, you know, you have to take a look at valuations and sentiment uh, and market positioning, uh, valuations, so on and so forth. The economy has never really mattered less mm -hmm. uh, as far as the correlation with the stock market. We go back to say right when the Fed issued the, more, uh, the memorandum on what they don't call QE4, on their hoovering up the T-bill market in early October, that at that point in time, the 12-month total return in the SPX was 1%, and it was 30% for the long bond. And lo and behold, by the end of the year, the total return 12 months scrolled is 30. And no, the economy didn't improve. And in fact, we started this year with Q4 operating EPS, the consensus pledged, we were gonna see close to 10% earnings growth. We're finishing the year right, well, as we're looking at the latest estimates from FactSet, negative 1.4 and the market generated a 30% total return. Uh, so I think that the bull market's really been uh, in financial engineering. When it comes to the economy and looking at the economic outlook, has everything been talking about has either been a hope and prayer for next year or we're looking at backward looking indicators. But I found it rather fascinating that as Mr. Market rallied on Boris Johnson and, and rallied on phase one uh, on soybean buying. Imagine you can spin the multiple three points on soybean buying and we got this QE. On, on, that, on talk about soybean yeah, buying. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know. right, of course. And the numbers but, talked about, don't forget, the, we're like two and a half X what was actually being spent two years ago. But the point buying. is that in all this, Details. Here, here's the gap between the financial economy and the real economy, the financial inflation and the, real, the inflation in the real economy is right as we had this trade deal and right as the money supply is booming, and I said before, the anomaly, of course, is that CNI loans are actually going down. The business roundtable came out for the fourth quarter for the coming six months. And business expectations, capital spending plans, and hiring intentions dial back in the quarter that made your entire year as a stock market, the CEOs that actually run the economy not portfolio managers that might run the stock market or the wealth managers that, uh, you know, that um, was talked about earlier, that they've dialed back to three-year lows. I'm looking, nobody talked about, you know, the, the conference board leaning on economic indicator came out a couple of weeks ago for November. Undercut expectations, the year over year in the LEI, a year ago was 5% when everybody was jumping under the table and screaming uncle, it's now down to zero. And actually, don't forget that one of the components no, no, of the LEI- one. It's point one. <laughs> point one. <laughs> if you, but one of the components, and this is what's laughable, is the stock market. Yep. And when you actually strip out the stock market contribution, the year for year in the LEI is actually below zero. Then if you go one step further and you look at the six components, that's actually the hard data, including jobless claims, including building permits, capital, goods orders and the like, the hard stuff, not the survey stuff mm -hmm. and not the yield curve and not the stock market, you're actually below zero year over year. Now, I'm not gonna say that's an infallible indicator, okay, there's been a couple of head fakes, but let's just say three out of every four times we have this condition in the LEI and its various components, we're heading in a recession in the next 12 months, the same recession that nobody, nobody ever sees the recession. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, you know, uh, I don't smell the carbon monoxide, do you? It's like the, the, nobody ever sees like the recession, even though, you know, and Ed said earlier, you know, the yield curve did invert. Uh, the New York Fed economic model, when you normalize it, got above, last summer, got above 80%. Now everybody gets excited because it's below 50. But mind you, it's below 50 whenever the recession starts. Whenever the recession starts, the yield curve is re-steepened. Yes. Everybody's celebrating what always happens before the recession. The yield curve does not stay inverted. And it leads, as Ed had said, by could be 12 to 24 months. And that's the thing that I will just say that, you know, Ed had said earlier, and this is where, you know, you're gonna ask economists uh, why they differ so much and your assumptions uh, drive your conclusions. Our assumptions are different. Uh, Ed's saying that the lagged impact of the Fed's easing is gonna play out nicely for bullish growth in 2020. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. That might show up in 2021. When you take a look at what the Fed did from late 2015 to late 2018, and you look at the, balance, you look at the QT, and you sum it up with the nine rate hikes, they de facto tighten policy by 400 basis points. And they've only unwound so far one third of it. And when you're talking about, you know, that what the Fed did in 27, 28, 29, going say, from 4%, 6%, 7% of the funds rate, what's most important is not where the funds rate is. Where is the funds rate benchmarked against the neutral rate? They, they've had all of a sudden a major mea culpa. I don't even know why they're not talking about cutting rates further. I guess maybe they're doing it de facto by re-expanding the balance sheet. 
But I think the neutral rate, and they're going to get there, is close to 1%, nominal. And they went as high, what is two and two and a half, two and three quarters, and they're still actually, and this is maybe why the bank lending numbers have started to contract, at least on the business side, is that policy is probably still too tight, notwithstanding what the stock market's telling you, which is something totally different than what's happening in the broad economy. So I'd say actually we're still going to pay the price from the over-tightening that the Fed did previously in those lags in the, the coming year. It seems to me that the uh, economic slowdown catalyst would have to be consumer views that uh, translate into consumer spending. There's these surveys that say, how do you feel about the present? And they're pretty strong. And that's the, that's the one that gets a lot of attention in the headlines. How do you feel about where we are right now? And it's at historically high levels, and it's maintaining those historically high levels. However, there's another question that gets asked, and that is, how do you feel about 12 months from now? And interestingly, the view of 12 months from now is terrible in these surveys, and it has been for a long time. And it's typical to go into a recession where you, that gap develops, and you ha you're kind of uh, have a warning signal that something bad might happen. But it doesn't happen until the view of the current condition starts to decline. So what you see is we have a very big gap right now between what people think about today versus 12 months from now. But it would need to start contracting with the view of the present getting worse. That'll take the labor market. That'll I agree. Take, that'll take that the will take, that's and, absolutely and, right. And that's, that's one thing I'll just I'll say on that point is where we have a recession. Well, we know we have a recession in corporate profits, OK? But we have a recession right now in productivity. Productivity, again, surprised to the downside, freshly negative in Q3. And we know, looking at the ISM that just came out uh, in the manufacturing sector in any event, uh, that the ratio of ISM production to employment was down 2.1 percentage points, by the way, to its lowest level in seven years. And so when productivity starts to go down, that's a signal to the business sector that, guess what, folks? You've overhired. I'll say right now, I was too bearish on the economy this past year. I actually thought that at some point we were going to have the corporate income lead the labor income, that we we're going to have the capital spending cutbacks lead into the labor market. But to me, it's just look, it's just timing. It's not like it's not going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen. But when productivity goes down, as a corporation, you got to think, well, are my order books expanding and that we're going to have demand catching up, or am I going to have to start right-sizing my labor to protect my productivity and profit margins? And I think that'll be the story. The labor market's yeah. got to start well, getting affected. Not, not, go ahead. But we've seen already past tense 13 weeks of weakening in jobless claims. That's it's, true. It's extremely quiet, but the That's breadth true. of jobless, you've got 67% of, of the states in the country in December had rising jobless claims. That's, that's very problematic. And, and if you talk about the 10 most populous states in the country, there you've got 80% of those yeah. states with, with rising jobless claims. Texas is teetering right now because of what's happening in the, in the oil patch and because there's literally war on the border. And the situation with Mexico being in recession is highly problematic for the state of Texas. Right. And, you know, you've got jobless claims up 13.2% year over year. These, these are real economies and real numbers, but at the same time, you've got wage inflation rising because companies know that they absolutely must hold on for dear life to their most skilled employees. That's why you could have this dichotomy in 2020 where you have rising wage inflation that gets people freaked out and put, pushes up bond yields, while at the same time, you have rising jobless claims. Yeah, not, not surprisingly, the labor market drives consumer f uh, you know, feelings right. and optimism and the like. And as I pointed out, that gap between the future and the present is, it's an alarm bell. It's not, it's, it's not a sell everything today because it hasn't triggered. Similarly, you never get a recession, almost definitionally, without those jobless claims going over their 12-month moving average. Right. You're on a warning signal there, too. As you've said, they've risen uh, in recent weeks uh, and months. But they're still not at the danger signal because the 12-month moving average is about 244,000. And I think we were 228,000 mm -hmm. is where we are right about now. So we're getting close. But I think it's premature to be fully alarmed until those claims cross over. Right. Let me mention average. that, uh, so again, I want to turn bearish. I'm just telling you. But uh, We're trying to help you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, know, you have this uh, late Thanksgiving uh, and the last time that happened, it claims had a big move up, 2013. So I'm going to wait uh, Fair on enough. that. And uh, I don't mean to be coming back to the same horse, 
but Dallas is booming. And Austin is booming. Well, there's a lot of Californians moving out of the high tech <laughs> state, and there's a lot of Connecticut people. That's moving. Not, very not true. That's true. Right. I mean, but I mean, so every every place has has a like, has a reason it's booming. Uh, you know, there's some. Uh, so one of my favorites is Bozeman, Montana, is booming. The guy says it, it, it's just a bunch of uh, Amazon guys, Microsoft guys, m want to own a little bit of Trout Stream, <laughs> so they go over there and buy it. Uh, my one of my favorites is Buffalo. Uh, is booming. It's and, booming. But thanks and, to uh, but, but I thanks do, to I do Toronto's think, uh, population <laughs> coming also, to also booming. Care. So I, I will. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I, I will say that uh, I, I agree completely uh, that employment is the key. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we uh, claims I'm going to watch closely. Uh, we uh, survey about 300 companies a week. Is Retailers. It the, is it the same ones? It's the same, the same, same ones, the same person. Ask them, how's your business? Uh, truckers, retailers, uh, home builders. And, and they're consistent with about 25 to 3% GDP growth. They didn't, haven't come down as much as I thought. Uh, we also survey a dozen temp and perm employment agencies. And their business is the best ever. It's like 67. Uh, now, there can be problems with that because it's, it's harder to get somebody to move uh, than just to stay at their, their, their job. But I'm just saying that general information I get uh, on employment is still pretty encouraging, including uh, the current consumer confidence numbers, which mm -hmm. give you some feeling about how consumers feel about the current situation. Uh, before, we can't get the tenure above two, given all of this good mm -hmm. stuff. So, my, um, we've, we've been, I can tell we've been communicating here. Uh, I don't particularly want the two, tenure to go above two. Uh, so like this last move down with the uh, conflict. Well, I wish the tenure would go over two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying it, it, it'd make my life a little more complicated. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, when it, it got up to what, one, one, 195, wouldn't that be a validation? I mean, that'd be a validation is... for your, for your growth scenario. Like, I can understand, it would. rising real rates would be financial tightening, quotes, that would be problematic for the stock market, right. which will have no bearing on the economy. I mean, if you're bullish on the economy, I, I mean, the, the, best, the best times the whole cycle was when the 10-year note went from a buck 35 after Brexit, it got as high as three. Okay, now at some point, it caused the stock market to choke. Right. But I got news for you, the stock market choked last year. You talked about how there's no high yield bond issuance. Guess what, GDP growth, when, when the stock market was having a coronary this time, or say 13 months ago, and the credit markets, GDP growth is the same today as it was back then. So I actually, if I had your macro view, I'd be thinking, well, we're gonna have inflation, and we're gonna have pricing power, and we're gonna have accelerating real economic growth. I mean, how, how does like how does a 10-year note not break the 2.5% based on your forecast? So, I mean, I, I keep thinking it is gonna do it. Well, that'd be bullish for your case, though. Listen, my case is working okay. <laughs> no, but you're, no, no, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Not necessarily because, because <laughs> well, I'm just saying, because the economy did not have a good year. The global economy did not have a good year. I'm talking and about the, the U.S. economy. Well, the U.S. economy didn't really have a good year. We've gone in the past three quarters, 3%, 2%, 1%, and then we're going to be sub one in the first quarter. Well, so it didn't a actually have a... So, so yeah. bond yields have actually been telling okay. you something so about the economy. So, so you, you and I know, know these numbers cold. GDP growth in the fourth quarter, year on year, is probably going to be 2.4%, uh, which is pretty decent. Uh, I saw over the holidays, I saw Brian Moynihan uh, had an interview, and they kept playing it over and over. And uh, the, he was forecasting 1.8 for 2020. And Jim, to your point, I think the, the, the consensus of economists for, for next year, mm -hmm. for, for this year, excuse me, is... 1.8. Yep. Uh, so Sounds about right. Uh, I don't know how you, how two to two point four, but it depends. What's your Q4? Because I'm I'm like one, barely more than one for Q4. So I don't have two four year. The okay. numbers have but, come up quite a bit because um, imports have fallen so much. Yeah, yeah. So there's some GDP math going on there. Yeah. One well, thing anyway. about one thing about the ten year, which I I've, I've got a lot of ways of thinking about. But one of the greatest ways of getting a starting point for where the tenure might be over the next several quarters, and it works uncannily well. It's really remarkable. I, sometimes I think this is all I should ever do, 
is you average U.S. nominal GDP year over year with the German tenure. Now, it used to be that people just said nominal GDP is a starting point for the tenure, but it stopped working. And it stopped working because the rates in Europe and Japan diverged so much, went negative while ours were still up around 2, two to 3 percent. So when you look at that, it's, it's sort of shocking how well it works. And right now, you would have the German tenure is stable. It's risen uh, from where it was with the global rise in interest rates off of the August, September so period. So what, minus, minus 20? It's, yeah, it went from negative 70 to negative 20 uh, or so. I haven't checked it today, but uh, it's minus it's 30. Um, minus 30 now. So if you use that, uh, the average of those two, it actually suggests that based upon a somewhat squishy estimate of where uh, year over year GDP is right now, because the data isn't all in and all that, it suggests that the tenure should be in the low twos. And uh, that's the highest level in a while because the German rate's gone up yeah. and the GDP surprised a little bit on the higher side with nominal GDP. Yeah. So it actually suggests that the move to 195 was not all that surprising and maybe it wouldn't be that strange to see us move above two uh, absent some sort of a, a global bond yield decline again uh, because uh, the, the GDP does seem to be like it should come in around the four Point, you know, nominal. Four, yeah, nominal, a four or four, two, something like that. And so you're talking about a 2% tenure. Also, another thing that I use, which has gotten a lot of play, I think, in the global media, is the copper-gold ratio. Yeah. The price of, coal, of, of copper in the commodity market, the price of gold, is an incredible short-term predictor of, where the, of the direction of the tenure. In, in fact, when the tenure was at three and a quarter, and was, had been heading higher in 2018, the copper-gold ratio starting before the bond rally started was collapsing. And I wish I had paid more attention to it because it was giving a very loud signal and I was a little bit skeptical of it. But right now the copper-gold ratio also suggests about a 2% tenure. So there's to, to corroborate that the yield level is sensible today, not really relative to the CPI by conventional you know, valuation metrics, but relative to these very to strong the indicators, they, it kind of makes sense where we are right now. Right. Can I ask you, um, let me throw a, st a statistic at you. So the 10-year in the U.S. at 180 right now uh, is the highest in the developed world for the first time back to the 1950s, that we are the highest developed world, long, not the long-term interest rate, we're also the highest short-term interest rate um, policy rate since 1980 as well. So we're actually technically tied with Canada right now uh, as well. That is, um, like I said, 40 years on the policy rate ever on the long-term rate. Uh, how much of a gravitational pull do you think there is from the rest of the world to pull our rates lower since we're standing up here and everybody else is done? Half of those are negative when you I, talk about yeah. the long end. I, th I think that it was uh, quite significant when the hedging cost to go back into the euro or back into the yen wasn't so prohibitive. That changed. It was you could pick up yield even after hedging mm -hmm. back in your own currency to eliminate the currency risk. The, that was possible uh, back in 2018, but then it went negative, and it's stayed negative ever since in the it's treasury market. Grown. I but I think it. what people have done, and I know this has happened in the corporate bond market when you look at the flow data, particularly out of Japan, is that they've, they're so desperate to, not, to extend that timeline to bankruptcy for the Swiss insurance company that they're forced into the most dangerous activity that there is in investing. We know that there's, we know that there's greed, that's pretty strong. We know that there's fear, that's even stronger. There's one thing that's stronger than either of the two of those, need. need. Mm -hmm. If you need, need to do something, you have no option. Mm -hmm. It's truly a need. So what they end up doing is they've been buying corporate bonds, not hedging their currency and buying treasuries, not hedging their currency. And that is one of the reasons that the dollar has held up, even though two of the fundamentals underneath the dollar suggest that it should be weaker. And it, is, it peaked three years ago. The Dixie Index peaked three years ago. Those two things that strongly suggest a weaker dollar are the Fed is easing, while, and, and at a rap, more rapid rate than is possible in some of these other countries, and the twin deficits, trade plus budget, are worsening as a percentage of GDP. Those two things are extremely highly correlated to dollar weakness. I think if you didn't have this naked buying, which has added incremental demand for the dollar, because in the past they would offset their dollar-based purchases, that the dollar is, uh, is poised to weaken. And so I think one of the most important things to think about for longer-term planning is that we could very likely see a weaker dollar. And that would lead to 
what's quietly started to happen in a very minor way, it could accelerate. And that is, ever since October of 2018, the U.S. stock market has, for all intents and purposes, stopped outperforming. It has not really outperformed since October 3rd of 2018. Uh, it's about the same. I mean, maybe it's outperformed by a few couple percentage points, but it's not that not like massive one. thing where it did for 10 years. The, the U.S. stock market was 100% outperformance, and a lot of that had to do with dollar strength and the attractiveness, and the economy was better, and our earnings were better, and we had a tax cut and all that stuff. But that's something to really watch for. And so as, as Steve pointed out, that he was doing some of his portfolios of, of incrementally uh, upping the non-dollar holdings, I think that that's really a wise strategy. And I've, I say this to uh, many wealth advisors, mm -hmm. and, and they say, you know, I thought that two years ago. I'm still not winning on that. And I said, but you're not really losing either. And it's always interesting when a trend that's very powerfully in place stops really continuing its trend, and people don't seem to notice. And this has happened. The, 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 the lack of further outperformance by the U.S. stock market happened without the dollar weakening. Not meaningfully. The dollar actually went up a quarter of a percent last year. It was one of the most incredibly stable, uh, stable years. But now it seems to me like it's lost all of its momentum. And maybe if you do get higher interest rates and you start to get, and they don't have to be very high, as we pointed out, 40 basis points was enough to break things. Right. If you would go to 220, that would be a 40 basis point move. You could start to see some unwind of, say, the Japanese purchases of corporate bonds because all of a sudden they could be losing on the currency and losing on the yield. And I think that that's a really systemic risk that exists for asset allocation that people need to be mindful of. So I just wanted to, to put that, that in the Let me add one more thing to that, or one more question to that, is that um, isn't kind of the core problem with a lot of the EM funding that's been, that's been done in dollars and there's been this global funding with dollars um, and not for their local rates. Um, if the dollar is not continuing to have strength or does not exhibit strength, isn't that actually a positive for all these borrowers out there that borrowed in dollars? And doesn't that give a little bit of stimulus if there is some weakening of the dollar that actually provides stimulus to the global economy? For, for you know, that would be true to the extent that exists. I mean, that it is out there, but have you looked to see how representative that is as a percentage of those local GDPs and what it might mean? I don't think it's enough to, 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 to push that cart forward. Mm -hmm. Just, it, it's not an impediment at that right. point. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. With that, I'm going to have to take another pause. When we come back, what we're going to do is ask each person what the biggest risks they see in 2020 and, and end it on a positive note of what your best idea is and, and wait for people to make money in 2020.